All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about golf. So with me here today, I have Coach Kevin Duffy. He is a TPI 1, 2, and 3 uh, strength coach. So for those golfers, you guys should know what that means. It means he's a uh, pretty knowledgeable strength coach in the world of golf for sure. He is the owner of Rotational Power and Strength in Acton, Massachusetts. He's rated a top 50 golf professional or fitness professional uh, from Golf Digest and has also spoken at a PGA conference in Florida before. He has 11 years of the coaching experience just like me. And for some reason, he's known for kicking down doors, which I don't know much about, but uh, I've seen it as a trend on your social media there. So you can you can tell me about that later, I guess. We'll leave the yeah. history there. Uh, but I'm bringing Kevin on here today to talk about golf and a lot of the things that I see as a PT, as a coach, um, but I am by no means a golfer uh, at all. I've been golfing, but I don't know much about it. And I've actually had quite a few patients that we can take care of from a physical therapy standpoint. Uh, but there's a lot my golfers teach me about the sport of golf. So who better to bring on than a golf and a uh, fitness professional to uh, put those pieces together for me. So Kevin, thanks for coming on. And, no um, and one of the big things we were just talking about beforehand and something you, you spoke about at that PGA conference was the training window of, and we see this all the time with athletes of any sport, but I think golf is a big one, especially for the age population demographic that plays golf. So um, you know, we got a lot of older people that will do some training in the winter or in their offices, but once golf season comes around, it's like, yep, yeah, we're not going to, we're getting out of the training room for the whole season. Uh, what do you have to say about that? And why is that a problem? Well, so I, you mentioned off mic earlier that you were a hockey player. So it's a similar concept that you would see in any other major sport. It's just looked at a little bit differently because it's a recreational sport. Golf is looked at a little bit more recreational, and for some people, it totally is. Some people play twice a year. Some people play twice a day. So you have all different levels of golfers. However, the concepts that would apply in any major sport would apply to golf because it is a major sport. It is played at the highest levels, and you can play it competitively or not competitively. But if you want to take a competitive edge, training is the easiest way to do that, especially when most of your peers – in the golf world aren't doing it, it would be the easiest way to get a step up. Similar to like, if for some reason you had one hockey team not train for any strength conditioning or any conditioning off ice, and then one team just do hockey, they'd probably still pre do pretty well, but ten, uh, more times than not, the team that is trained and conditioned better than the other will win. So it's, a concept that's a little bit lost on golfers for some reason, but not on any other sport. So for me, carving out a niche there and trying to give people that advantage is, is where I'm kind of making, making my living right now. And it's, it's a fun place to be that comes with some nice perks of playing some really nice golf courses. So, you know, you're, you're over there near Vesper. So use some of those perks and some client privileges to get out on that golf course. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, I'll add to that too, what you're saying about the two hockey teams is I don't think it's just the physicality of being stronger and faster from weight training is going to make the hockey team better. I think a big part of that that parallels both sports too is the longevity and sustainability throughout a season, right? So maybe we see some, some injuries right up front in golf. It's like, oh, I haven't rotated all year and now my low back hurts. Um, but if you're playing a couple times a week, a couple times a day sometimes, or 18 holes, 32 holes, whatever, it, same in hockey. Like later in the season, guys get more and more banged up. The body starts breaking down more and more. And that's where we see uh, some of the interesting pieces of like playoff hockey is, oh, this guy's out, that guy's out. Everyone's breaking down now where we see guys that are in better shape have more – mass have more resiliency have more motor options and movement options just they fare much much better than someone that hasn't done any of those things so yeah um as we talk about here so so why is it important for golfers to train through the year okay yeah the the in-season training is something i've been 
pushing more over the last probably three years. Um, as a young coach, I used to not push it as hard, and I used to just talk on the fact that, hey, I should have seen you in the off season. Uh, now, as I got, grew older and wiser, I'm like, just fix the people that you have in front of you. Be happy that they came in. Be happy that they're willing to change and, and fix their, their current issue rather than try to lecture the past. It, it's useless. So uh, in season, my goal is to make you more robust, or as I tell my clients, just don't get weaker. It's, I don't want to make a t-shirt because it, it's not really a sexy saying, but but I try to think of what's going to stick with my people and the idea and their whole goal, all golf season is don't get weaker because the sentence that frustrates me the most is, hey, Duff, I was doing so awesome at the beginning of the year. My totals were up. I was hitting it further. I had a shorter club into this hole that I never have. It's so much easier to score this way, X, Y, and Z. And then I don't know what happened. But at the end of the year, I didn't have the same thing. And they'll give themselves a cop out. Maybe it was a, you know, their equipment's old. Or they'll say the weather changed. And I'm like, no, man, you, you got weaker. It's, you were rotating very fast. Your club head speed was very high. And it was easier to make that move that you wanted to make. Whereas you went eight to 12, you know, sometimes longer, sometimes, you know, three months at a time without touching a weight or, or training or stretching, whereas you used to, and your body is responding negatively. I'm not surprised, but now instead of me just giving them that lecture, I'm like, all right, man, let's get back to work, you know, or, or, or you know, my, my female golfers honestly understand it and do it more often than my male golfers. So in the training industry, you know, obviously everybody thinks about training more male athletes because it's like more male dominated sport. However, my, my female golfers, they listen better and they get awesome results and they, they don't stop training, which I'm very happy about. So my, my lady golfers are, are some of my, some of my favorite clients right about now. Yeah. The, the male ego sometimes get in the way of, we always think we're right and we, we know best and, and we'll be fine on our own where women in, in the fitness industry that are, that have coaches, I think are just a little bit different where they um, look to their coach for guidance more and take that guidance as something they'll trust and do. So we have the I same. I wasn't going to say ego, but that's right. <laughs> yeah. Same, same experience over here. Um, and so th there's a really good, um, kind of analogy you used about the car with the, the brakes and everything you, you said before. So um, I think that's something good. So you can speak on that behalf of, of what was it? Yeah. So the, the, it's, it's an easy analogy, but you know, sometimes like for the nutrition one, it's super easy for people to understand like, Hey, if you're going to go on a long road trip, do I want to have a full tank of gas before I go? Do I want to have premium fuel in there? Or do I want to have, you know, putzing along with a low amount of fuel. So everyone's like, oh, of course I want to have food. I want to have fuel. There you go. Okay, so that's an easy analogy. When you get into the car, more specifics, uh, when you talk about uh, the training ways that I want to approach it, is that I want to build up the chassis first. I want to load on the brakes and I want to worry about making sure everything's stable, sturdy. All, you know, all four tires are even, not one side stronger than the other before I worry about installing a brand new engine. Because if I put a brand new engine inside of a golf cart and still have those tiny golf cart brakes, I'm just going to be the guy who's slamming into the wall. And so that analogy kind of hits home with people to understand that when you're trying to prevent injuries, what's the best way to go about it? And it's building up the brakes. So your anti-rotation drills, building up the chassis, making sure that you're, you're able to handle the new club head speed that you have um, before I worry about club head speed drills that are sexy and cool and, see everybody doing, you know, there are people who are doing 180 box jumps in my gym, but they have done farmer's walks and hex bar deadlifts for months before that happens. So uh, we do the sexy, cool stuff, but the slogan is uh, do the simple things savagely well for uncommon results. And I, I try to live by that because the results are, are there and nobody comes to me for that quick, fast turnaround in two, three weeks because it's not realistic. So uh, there are people out there who have done the work uh, ahead of time that I could really help in two, three weeks, but 
most of my clientele do not fit that bill. So you're saying it's a bad idea to wait till three weeks before golf season starts to come see you and be like, hey, I got to get in shape? Yes, it is. It is a bad idea. However, if you do that, you're probably just going to peak at a different time than you want to. So in New England, like for like younger coach, younger coach Kev would be like, you're such an idiot. Don't do that. Current coach is like, all right, man, I wish you didn't do that. But here, here's the plan. Here's how we can fix this. And you're probably going to like be a little bit annoyed in the beginning of the spring season. But luckily in New England, our peak golf and peak tournament and like, especially like if my better players are, are playing in like, um, you know, my college players are their th- golf is a fall season for them. Uh, and then late summer, they're all playing in the mass golf tournaments or amateur tournaments. So that's kind of like that late summer, early fall block. So the peaking block is a little bit different for them versus, you know, some, some guys or girls might want to be peaking for like, Hey, all, all off season, I did nothing. And then I'm about to go take a trip to Myrtle beach and play eight rounds in a row. I'm like, Oh shit. Hold on to your, hold on, man. Let's just, let's yeah. All right. Here's your, here's your rehab drills. Here's your stretches that you're going to need. And here's a lot of farm walk. Here's a lot of deadlift and let's do what we can do. And so, as you said, your slogan was, what was it again? Uh, do the, do the simple things savagely well for uncommon results. I love that. And I think that's something too, I've seen in the industry just with, see a lot with personal trainers or coaches that just don't know how well the simple and the, the simple things and the fundamentals work so well of we have someone that is a golfer that's just gotten into fitness and it's like, Oh, well let's put them on a BOSU ball and throw a ball and have them catch the ball or yeah. <laughs> so don't, don't put them on a BOSU ball, please. Don't, don't ever put anyone on a BOSU ball. Um, you can do core work on it. You don't have to deflate them all, but like stop standing on them. Yeah. So stop standing on them. But as you said, there's so many sexy type drills that trainers and coaches want to have people do. What is the problem with that? And what should really be the focus? So someone comes in brand new to training. They've been golfing for a while, you know, avid to advanced level golfer. Where should we start with training? Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to take them through an eval first, uh, and hopefully for everybody who's listening to this podcast, I'm sure you've already talked about, hey, get some type of evaluation, but for anybody who hasn't, if you're going to a new coach and they're not giving you, even if it's like, even if I, if that coach labels it as uh, Duff's eval, as long as you're doing some sort of eval, that's going to be an advantage, but in my gym, we're going to do a TPI eval first. Uh, and then I basically bring them through what I call RPS one. So RPS one is my beginner level program so that I can hit these check boxes before I look at the uh, immediate advancement. And if you come in to me, you have your TPI exam and you do well in RPS one, I'm, I can advance you faster than, than I need to. I don't have to follow a perfect checklist. Like if you come in, you're a big, strong dude and you can deadlift with really good form. Why would I give you a band around your hip and just, you know, have you do a rehab drill because, you know, an old template somewhere told me to do that. Um, Luckily, as you know, you and I both know, you can coach for 11, 12 years and make executive decisions to advance someone faster than the, uh, what are the old templates? Uh, I mean, just I remember the college templates, like, no, you have to follow this. And I was like, no, you don't. So you can advance people or a lot of times I regress people um, in certain areas and I progress people in other areas, which is more common. A lot of people come in and say, hey, Duff, I need more mobility or I need more flexibility. And I'm like, all right, that's great. I take a look at them. And really, they're just having trouble rotating because they're unstable. So that's the most common thing I see uh, is people think they need a lot of flexibility, and a lot of mobility. Um Generally, both of those things will increase when I increase their ability to be stable. So I'm going to obviously address all three. Like if someone's got terrible thoracic rotation, like they're getting uh, thoracic spine mobility for sure. I'm not going to skip it. But in most of those cases, 
they'll probably have um, unstable legs because they need to create, you know, some rotation somewhere so they can still play the game they love. So the eval will go from TPI screening, uh, depending on their level of injury or profile, they'll do a power uh, output, and then we will get into RPS one, and then advance them either fast or slow, depending on the results. And so, so what does that assessment actually look like? If you can can give me some insight into that, of what's the TPI? The TPI score? or my own? The TPI, I guess, and then we can okay, go so- your own. Yeah, so for for the TPI, they they made my job really easy recently. So they used to just have, um, and I know you remember this, so you'll get this reference, but the FMS screens where you just fill out on a white piece of paper a checklist and hand them to the person and be like, this is useful for you. And they're like, thank you. And I throw it away. So, So that used to be what the TPI screen was. I had a piece of paper and I could refer back to it on my clipboard. And I could look and be like, oh, that's right. They were really bad at um, hip hinging. I'm like, hey, have you been working on hip hinging out of the out of the gym? They're like, what's that? So now TPI has made it a little bit easier. They have TPI Pro. So TPI Pro is an app. I input their results. Um, they give a standardized exercise prescription, um, which I can add or take away from on my end. Generally, I'm, I'm adding. Uh, and then they can take that home with them. So if I give them a TPI eval and I give them the homework and then I come back and I ask them about it and they haven't done it, I, I can kind of judge what type of clientele I'm going to be working with. Um, the people who are going to get results faster are the people who are doing their homework. You're only with me one hour or two hours a week. I don't care what certifications or badges or golf digest logos I have. You only work out one hour a week and sit at a chair or, or do other really bad patterns. It doesn't matter how badass my resume is or how cool my program is that exactly is not going to, not going to give you any results. So the, the TPI app has made my homework side of the house so much easier. Um, and there so, is, so is that there's, just a- there's other ways to like add more stuff on there. Uh, eventually I'll figure that out, but right now I'm doing so much in-person coaching that uh, I got to work outside of the business a little bit more. And with the my son being born like Saturday, I'm hoping to do more of that. <laughs> and so the TPI screen is more of just like a basic movement screen where you're also doing like a, a performance assessment after that? Yeah, you can do um, TPI uh, one, which would basically be your movement screening, like how do you move? And then there's a power test as well. There's uh, clients that I won't do that right away with I'll, I'll just get to work and then we'll power test later but some of my like college golfers and high level uh, amateurs are I'm, I'm power testing uh, so what do you way. what do you do for power testing so there's like a uh, kneeling and seated uh, med ball throws there's broad jumps I like to do a 90 degree broad jump in both directions to see how big the gap is um, there's like a cable push down but like instead of like your traditional like let's say from a football side of the house to where I came from, like your bench squat deadlifts, like those aren't, those aren't important there. Um, uh, there is a cable pull. There's like how much you can pull. There's a squeeze. Um, I, I can't remember what that hand. Um, and dynamometer. Yeah. That thing. I don't have one of those, but I would, I would like that. And then uh, there's a vertical jump. Um we know that club head speed and vertical jump are the closest physical correlation. So like, for example, uh, well, he's on the live tour now, but we still, we still know this guy, Dustin Johnson has a huge vertical jump and his club head speed is massive, you know, formal basketball player. So those, those correlations exist. Like Bryson can jump very high. He's got high club head speed, big athlete. Uh, Rory's got incredible rotation. So there's, we know that the guys who can jump, very well are going to have an easier time creating a higher club head speed. So vertical jump improvement is a large part of my programming. And so it's interesting because like we said, like we think about golf as a rotational sport and and it's like the only thing we should train is, is rotational type movements or that's what a lot of people think they should do to get ready for golf season. But you mentioned in another podcast that step ups, pull ups, and carries were your favorite exercises. So we can we can say a, a carry, depending on how you're doing it, is an anti-rotation movement. Um, 
that's also, you know, hitting the, the frontal plane. But um, so why are those the big ones and not, not the rotational movements? Well, the rotational movements are important. And I will lead with those exercises more to like continue the conversation, right? And you, you kind of, you get this because I'm leading, right? So uh, rotational exercises are definitely important to improve your club head speed and your ability to use your strength. However, a lot of people are always moving laterally in their sport and they don't spend enough time, you know, either resisting that or creating the ability behind that. So like, it's easier for me to create tension um, in a you know straight up and down position and then have it correlate easier to a lateral drive. Whereas if I just consistently put a med ball in your hand and have you throw it, I'll probably see improvements, but I won't see improvements as much as if I get you to do a really strong, strong deadlift, which puts you in a strong base position, which puts you stronger at a dress before you go to create all that violent speed. So, I say that those answers to kind of continue the conversation. But if you if you can do a pull up and you have strong lats, you're more likely to put yourself in a good uh, advantageous posture at address, which is going to make your job easier of creating that you know that uh, rotational force easier. So I kind of look at it that way. Like, how can I make your job easier without? always just having to feel like I'm the super golfy exercise guy. I'm probably not the most golf lookalike exercise coach out there. Actually, I'm definitely not. Uh, whereas I know that there's, there's a little bit more that goes into it behind the scenes versus what you just are going to see on Instagram. I mean, I, I put out some of those sexy girls sometimes on Instagram, but I try to create a, message on social media that you can copy and I'll feel safe that you're not just doing some crazy shit um, you know, that you saw on uh, somebody did a uh, 180 box jump with like a 8 to 10 pound med ball in their hand and uh, he ate it and he like hit his toe and like went head over heels so that was bad I saw that on oh Dylan Fratelli's Instagram which is hilarious because he's a good dude but like Come on, man. Why are you posting that? <laughs> it was funny. But. Yeah. And uh, so you mentioned, too, the the hex bar or trap bar deadlift is your favorite type of deadlift variation. So why why trap bar over any other deadlift variants? Uh, less likely for my golf athletes to get injured. Bottom line. Um, when I go to deadlift, I will give my clients a wide grip barbell deadlift first because it's going to really exaggerate that, you know, that pinch between their shoulder blades, which is, I'm going to keep coming back to that, right? Um, it's going to exaggerate that a little bit more before I go traditional or sumo. Um, I do like doing sumo deadlifts or, or traditional deadlifts from the floor as long as my athlete's able to kind of keep a little bit more of that neutral spine. I have a little bit less tolerance for high load with like a little bit, you know, you, you were a power lifter. There's going to be a little bit of curve when they get to a heavier number. and It's not necessarily a big deal, but I'm just going to spend a little bit more time with my golfer stressing a uh, good posture at a dress. Posture, posture, posture is... I'm going to, I'm going to say it till the cows come home. Yeah. So, so that's a good point you bring up. And, and this is something I believe in too, um, where not only as a strength coach, but as a PT, depending on what we're doing, there are different bandwidths of constraint that I'm going to keep someone in because mm-hmm. of maybe the sport. So I've always found working with golfers myself that the individuals that do strength train and, and, really know the fundamentals well of like maybe they got into golf after they got into bodybuilding, whatever the case may be when they really know how to hinge. It makes my job so much easier to be able to get them back to golf Um, because they're just able to know where their shoulder position is going, how to set themselves over the ball, how to put their, their body and balance over their feet and then be able to produce rotation from there. When I have people that are golfers 
that I have a really hard time teaching the deadlift. I feel like there's a lot of lost pieces probably in their swing that's I'm not a golf pro or, or anything like that, but something else that needs to be done to get them back to the fundamentals that would probably help their swing a lot. If we just knew the fundamental of a hip hinge and a deadlift. Yeah. The deadlift, the deadlift is like the king. So the king of the swing for me is address and deadlifts. Those are the most important thing at, I'm going to start there. Um, you know, the RPS one program is what I talked about after the, after the test, but like the first thing the TPI is going to assess you on is like your ability to hip hinge. So it's basically, um, can you stand over like a mid iron, uh, say a seven iron in neutral spine, or if when that, demand which is the first thing you do when you step to the golf course if you can't do that it's it should be where we start you know and uh they have like a rating system so like if you fail the hip hinge your score is going to be sky high you want it to be low like in golf so if you fail the hip hinge like i can automatically tell you it's going to tell you like your score is like you're going to be like a 20 or 30 physical handicap which uh, I know you don't know the handicap system here, but you don't want to hear somebody saying, I'm a 20 handicap golfer. Like they are not having a, uh, well, they might still be having a good time out there, but they're not good. I, I actually learned a little bit about the handicap system last week oh, from good. one of my clients, but still a bit confusing to me. So I'm still working through that, uh, that algorithm. The lower the there. number, the better. Yeah. The lower the number, the better. So if you have somebody single digit, or if you have somebody say they're a plus, they're really good. Yeah, I think my, I mean, the better they are, though, like the kid that I have on Corn Ferry and the the guy, uh, the guys that are playing at uh, Rutgers, they don't carry a handicap, so that's also a, a thing. It's like a badge of honor. Yeah, that's a whole different conversation we'll have to have. Yeah, they're shooting in the numbers that I don't understand. I can't. Yeah, they're like, oh, I shot a sixty-five. I'm like, what's that? You can get that? Yeah. So. <laughs> um. And so I think another piece is, and you mentioned this briefly, is the mobility versus stability for a golfer of everyone thinks in all parts of the world and anyone that's lifting weights, everyone's like, oh, I need more mobility, where a lot of the times that might not be the case. So with, do you see this across the board with golfers or I think some of this can be related to age, but like thoracic rotation is hugely important for golf. Now we could be very mobile, but if we don't have control of it, we will feel stiffness and move in a very stiff manner because we don't have the fundamental properties to just control our basic level fundamental rotation. So however, as we age, we typically see that a thoracic spine and the rib cage will get stiffer and stiffer. So is it more younger golfers just have a, a I don't want to say stiff because it'll confuse people, but a, a, a spine that they don't have the stability of where they just need more stability and they fail stiff versus what happens as we get older, maybe our 40s or 50s, do we see or do you see people that have actually like more of a true stiffness of the thoracic cage? Yeah, so we know and I think um, the – the physical therapist who works at my gym, Tim Ravoto, just put out a post on our social media. It said something like, I think it was, as you age, it's somewhere in the 10 percentile range of, of loss of mobility. Um, you, I'll, I'll refer to you guys, you know, my PTs of the, of the world to, to know those numbers. But the, the thing I see the most often is that a younger golfer will not have a – mobility need as much as an older golfer will. However, I have seen more younger golfers who are, we know where the game's going. It's not getting shorter, it's getting longer. So I now see younger golfers who are more in pain because they're trying to create so much club head speed, but they don't have the brakes required with that speed that they now have. So they are getting hurt in their back and they come to me and say, hey, coach, I need more flexibility or I need more lower back or mid back mobility because the older people who do need that mobility or flexibility are writing the papers or the blogs that they are reading or, or, or videos that they're producing. So a 40 year old swing instructor 
who deals with older clientele has got a really good social media following on Instagram. I will have a kid who has club head speed that's through the roof, looks like a tall, skinny giraffe, and come to me and say, Coach, I need more mobility. Meanwhile, he could sit in a chair and just totally to the other side of the room. I'm like, no, you are deadlifting like a baby bird. You got no weight on that bar. You you can't hinge properly. And if I ask you to do more than five pull-ups, I might be lucky if you can. So that kid, uh, and I've had that kid in the gym, that kid needs stability big time. And then we add that and he's like, coach, I'm actually hitting it further now. I'm like, hey, 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 cool. That's cool. Does your back hurt? They're like, oh, no, I forgot about that. I'm like, wow. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm going to still give that kid, like, generally with the kids, I have to slow them down. Otherwise, they'll just go through the program at, a, you know, a million miles an hour. So I'm going to give them their rib rolls, their 90-90s, their hips, their, you know, their cars and their stuff like that. More to, like, slow them down, get a breather. Okay, let's get back on that trap bar. Um, but, I mean, definitely I have some youth golfers who have got some um, – a lot of, you know, you get some tech, uh, tech's neck with the kids. Yep. Uh, I, I have some bad, uh, for some reason, you know, I see it in young moms where they're, you know, holding a baby on one side and they've got one bad hip. But I'm also seeing a lot of young girls who are complaining about tightness in their left hip, but they stand around all day, just like left hip bumped out. And so, yeah, I see, see a good amount of that. But for my male golfers, my male youth golfers, I see what I describe, you know, high club head speed, low back stuff, and they need stability. Then on the other side of the coin with my older guys, they have been swaying a lot to create more speeds. They might have some hip issues and they're desk bound. So that thoracic spine is, is a factor. Uh, But generally for them, it's more a lack of disassociation between upper and lower half more than it is lack of thoracic spine mobility problem. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably a little bit more, you know, upper shoulder uh, and neck. Uh, and a lot of, I eval the guy who was terrible at looking to the left, which would impact his downswing. And I figured it out because his screen, his major screen, his monitor was over here. Yep. So he was looking like this all day, you know, off to his right corner. And when he went left, he felt tightness. And so it was hard for him to follow through and swing we made him i made him move his monitors he fought me on it i don't know why but he fought me on moving his monitors like rearranging a desk is not that hard and he rearranged his desk and he's like hey man my neck pain went away i'm like no way dude so shocked so surprised did you get a standing desk no my god damn man yeah (laughs) one for two ergonomics are huge and, and that's what you know people come in too and that's a big thing we see all the time is I had someone I had this conversation with yesterday. It's like, oh, um, well, somebody's going to refer someone to me. He's like, but I don't know if they're going to do their homework. I was like, well, do they even need homework? She's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, if, if we're doing this all day and this hurts, like I have to get rid of this first before I start adding any fancy, sexy exercise in. So what if it is just the desk setup? What if it is the way his chair is or his computer monitor is positioned or how he's hanging out at night. If we're sitting in a chair all day and then we go slump into a lazy boy every night, like maybe we just need to change that up a little bit. Yeah. And so, so there's a lot, lot to be said there. I think the other thing too, like you said, and so for all you younger golfers out there that might be listening to this, uh, you truly can feel stiffness in a thoracic spine, even though it's mobile because you don't have control. An easy thing to do would be go into a half kneeling position up against the wall, try to rotate yourself around, then go do a core exercise like a dead bug, a bird dog, um, or a bear crawl and come back after about 10 to 20 repetitions and see how much smoother that rotation feels. If it feels better and moves easier and you can rotate further, it's very likely you don't have a true mobility issue where you need mobility that just reinforces that you need more stability. So I just wanted to, to make note of that. Uh, another thing too, and this might be a, a hard question to answer or a loaded question, but 
is there a point when golfers should be lifting heavy? Is there a, a line we need to draw in the sand where we say we don't need any less than X reps for a golfer? Because I think a lot of it, and this might change through the lifespan too for someone where a younger golfer, maybe we want them in the off season. Do we want them doing heavy deadlifts for like triples or anything like that? Yeah. So uh, I'll answer that question in two ways. It depends on what level of golfer I'm dealing with. If it's a guy working on winning the club championship, but he's got a regular, regular life and he plays once or twice a week and practices two or three times. Great. Uh, do I need him to lift heavy relative for him? Yes, absolutely. Now, if I have a golfer who's trying to win the big tens, does he need to train heavier than he w- might want to in the off season so that when it comes time for big tens, he can reach 113, 114 mile an hour club head speed? Oh yeah, yeah. he has to. The regular club pro golfer would benefit from it, but it, you know my risk reward ratio um, will be a little bit on the safer side. I mean. 95 pounds for him could be heavy, right? And if he's deadlifting 95 to 150, we could be, you know, seeing some serious benefits. He's not going to reach the club head speed. That's, you know, he's not going to reach those 112, 100, you know, crazy club head speed. But I got golfers who are trying to get to 113, to 120 club head speed. Oh, yeah, you better lift heavy. <laughs> You're creating so much force, my man. You better lift. Now, there's a special piece of that though too, where we can see certain adaptations get in the way of particular right. sports, right? So if we look at powerlifters and bodybuilders, there's <clears throat> being a physical therapist in, in this, the place I'm in is really cool with the types of athletes I get to see because you see adaptation of sport in so many different ways. And one of them is, you know, we need weightlifting and powerlifting are similar in ways of it's, it's, you know, a one rep max as heavy as you can go. However, like with powerlifting, squat, bench, and deadlift, we see this, you know, ultimately we have a lot of stiffness that we adapt to because we have to be almost overly stable to move as much weight as steadily as possible and a, the smallest range possible without any error. And so these guys don't really have any relaxation to their muscle tone where – we see with weightlifters, there is much more of this ability to relax. Like if I have someone on the table and I'm working on a shoulder, I have to remind a power lifter or cue them somehow to relax multiple times throughout a session where a weightlifter just seems to be able to do it because there's much more of a sense of there are certain times when you have to create a lot of tension, but also points where you need to be in a state of relaxation and then create tension again, which I think is much of a parallel of golf of, we need to be able to to have mobility, but we also need to create stability and force created at that point of impact, but then relax again. So yeah, the, can heavy sure. lifting get someone in trouble in golf? And what do we need to do to counteract yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, you can definitely uh, get yourself in trouble. If you go by a dr- traditional bodybuilding program as a golfer, um, I would say – Instead, like if I had to choose like that or nothing, I'd probably still choose something along those lines. I mean, there's more literature out there to do it safer. Um, but yeah, you can definitely lift your way into some trouble. Um, I traditionally am not going to give my clients anything uh, under a, maybe a three rep max, I, generally a five. I don't spend a lot of time max testing my athletes. It doesn't risk reward ratio gets a little wonky for me. But yeah, if you if you spend a ton of time lifting, you know, traditional barbell curls and frontal exercises and pulling your shoulders forward and doing a ton of bench, it's you're you're gonna get in the way of your golf swing. But like if someone's saying, hey, you're gonna get too bulky for your swing to work, you'd have to like really try hard to do that. You'd have to really be training without intentions of uh, advancing yourself in your sport. Uh, you know, at, I don't know about you, but at one point in time in the weight room, I was so obsessed with getting bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. I almost lifted my way out of my position on the football field because I got so big 
and so strong that I couldn't cover a slot receiver as a linebacker. At no point in time would you think that you got too big and too strong as a linebacker to do your job. But if you lift with the intention of just getting big and strong without getting big, strong, fast, and mobile, you might find your way to the bench. My coach, I'm only five foot ten. If he tells me if I get bigger or stronger or slower, I have to go play defensive end, oh, hell no. No, thank you. So you can get yourself in trouble in any sport with uh, without lifting with intention of progressing your sport. If you're if you're a high school golfer, it's like, hey, coach, I just want to get bigger arms. And I happen to play golf, but I'm not good enough to play um, in college. Can you give me a program that'll you know uh, you know build up some confidence, get some bigger shoulders, and fill out my t-shirt? I'm not gonna be like, no, you have to do. Da, da, da. I'll be like, all right, dude, here's some chin ups. Let's do a set of fan curls. Yeah, man, go get it. Fill out your t-shirt. Have fun. I mean, yeah. I'm not. If if somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, I'm on the Corn Ferry tour and I want to go, you know, play on the PGA tour, and I also uh, really would like to prioritize uh, bench press max. I'm like, no, yeah, no, you won't. And I, I think it comes down to, and this is, <clears throat> it really comes down to the the training adaptation or the way you're training. Like you can train to get strong but you also have to do other things in training to make sure you're not getting slow. Like you can't just train like a tugboat uh, as a powerlifter or bodybuilder, like because weightlifters and powerlifters can have very similar strengths with, with the squat and deadlift, um, but they move completely differently. And it's because weightlifters are doing some, they're doing fast training and, and we're, we're training this like tension relaxation piece and, and we don't lose our mobility because we're moving to end range every day where, yeah, if you're just doing heavy trap bar deadlifts every day. So I think the real piece there is, and I think it's too, there are weightlifters that are huge, right? They're muscular, they're jacked, they can look like bodybuilders, but then we look at them and they're super mobile and there's no yep. mobility limitations where you don't see that nearly as much with a power lifter. But so I think it just goes to, to show that you can get bigger and there is a way to train to get bigger, stronger, and be faster without losing mobility. You just got to make sure we're involving the speed, the rotation, the mobility piece yeah. of that, and we're not losing that or sacrificing that for strength. Would you agree? Yeah, there's there's two golfers that come to mind who have kind of flirted with the lines of bigger and faster and mobility-wise. So like Bryson DeChambeau got really big, really strong, still won the U.S. Open, but he's kind of flirting with danger now, hasn't won recently, he's not doing really good on longevity. Brooks Kepka did the same thing, got bigger, got stronger, won a U.S. Open, won some majors, but not doing great with longevity, whereas like Matthew Fitzpatrick and Roy McIlroy still train. They're, Matthew Fitzpatrick put a high priority on putting on weight and club head speed, won the U.S. Open at the Country Club, and then Roy McIlroy just won – uh, the year-long championship, which is one, the biggest paycheck, good for you. Two, uh, who doesn't love Roy McIlroy? And number three, anybody who lifts looks like Roy and um, has the longevity to last the entire PJ Tour season and rack up the most points to get that largest paycheck just solidifies all the arguments that I get into, uh, which happen less and less now. Uh, about training and golf and how it correlates and should I do this all year or should I try this? I'm like, the guys who win do, so the guys who last do. Uh, but anytime a long bomber uh, wins a PGA Tour event, mm, I'm very happy. <laughs> anytime who hits somebody who hits it far or just talked about how they trained and they, they, you know, their coach, their strength coach puts out a post, I'm like, repost. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so. Uh, that covers a lot. Are there any other things to wrap up here that you want to mention for uh, advice to, to golfers or to summarize? Other than don't stop training. <laughs> uh, I would say train, uh, train throughout for sure. Um, but don't be afraid to train, you know, play around with your training, find out what's working for you. And if there's a feeling that you're trying to create on the range, if there's like a loading pattern or I'm trying to feel more separation, find some ways or find a, a pro in your area that'll help you 
create a feel in the weight room that feels easy to take over to the, the course. There's a lot of times that I have clients who are trying to feel more lag uh, or more separation, and we try to create a drill that'll create that feel that they then work on it on the range. And when they get it honed in on the range, it's it's easier for them to take it to the course rather than try to make your golf swing look like the weight room. Try to make your or sorry, flip that. Try to make the weight room help your golf swing rather than trying to make your your golf swing carry over. Uh, into the weight room where you're standing on a BOSU ball or which has no correlation or just doing a loaded chop pattern all the time. Your body does enough of that. Please just go for a long walk in the hallway with some heavy weights, uh, get your shoulders back, set up in strong address uh, uh, and, and you'll, you'll love the results. All right, man. Uh, thanks for the advice and thank you for coming on. Um, this is awesome just to kind of sit and talk shop and learn some stuff about uh, golf and training side and what uh, we can do to look at golfers a little bit differently and for golfers to understand how important training is too, because I think it's a headache we all have to have all the time with any type of athlete, uh, especially our guys that love to take off for the summer and, and just drink beer and, and play golf with the boys and then come to us three yeah. weeks before spring season starts. So uh, you Kevin, have to train before you go on your spring trip, please. Yeah. And so where can people find you? <clears throat> Yeah, so my gym's in Acton, Massachusetts, uh, looking to expand relatively soon, so we'll stand by for that. Um, but right now we're inside the practice grounds in Acton, Massachusetts. Uh, social media is, everything is at, at Coach Kevin Duffy on Instagram, Twitter, all that. And then the website is CoachKevinDuffy.com. All right, great, man. Thanks for uh, coming on and talking shop with me today. And... Um, for anyone that has any questions for me or for Kevin, uh, if you can't spell his name, which is pretty simple, uh, feel free to message us as well and we can forward you his information and we'll put some uh, his contacts in the show notes as well. So, Kevin, thanks for coming on. It's great to have you here today. No problem, Brent. Thank you for having me. appreciate it.